So uh, if you would like a copy of it, uh, just let us know. We'd be happy to um, share that with you. Anyways, um, let's dive into it here. We've got kind of a lot of fun and interesting stuff to talk about. So before we get anything too big picture here, I want to point out first off, this is educational. Um, as we're having these discussions, uh, if, if uh, you would like to dive in a little bit deeper, please consult a, a licensed financial professional. We are licensed financial professionals, but everyone on this call is going to be a little bit different. So I'm going to give some generic advice, but make sure that you are working with that financial professional to get good advice. Also work with a good CPA uh, tax professional. We will talk about some tax strategies here that we think make a whole lot of sense. So with that in mind, let's, uh, let's jump into this. So I'm going to start here with a whiteboard. So you all know I love talking on whiteboards here. The big key before we even start talking about investments or anything like that is we want to make sure that we have the right tax qualification. Okay, so here is uh, where we're going to start our discussion. The big piece that we're recommending to everyone, especially right now, given the situation, given everything that we're going through, we want to make sure that we're utilizing Roth IRAs. Now, again, I'm, I mentioned I'm giving generic advice here. This is generic but I think generically everyone should be participating in a Roth to some extent. If you're still working, if you have earned income, the contribution limit this year, $6,000 for those under the age of 50, $7,000 for those over the age of 50. Um, we're at the start of the year, so it's a perfect opportunity to start budgeting out and planning how you're gonna make those contributions and please, please, please max them out. I think that that's a very, very good thing. Um, the whole discussion with a Roth, um, I guess let's dive into it for those who, who don't really uh, know or understand some of the differences. A Roth IRA is funded with after-tax dollars, meaning you've already paid payroll tax on them. Um, there's no special tax write-off or anything like that. But the big key with this is that all growth, oops, all growth and all distributions are tax-free. Now we don't know what taxes are going to do, but I have a sneaking suspicion that they're probably going to go up. And you know, this isn't even a political thing, and I don't want to make it a political thing. The um, the uh, Tax and Jobs Act that was passed in 2018 was built with an expiration date. We know that taxes are going to go up by December 31st of 2025. That was built into the tax code that we revert to what 2017 numbers are, or whatever Congress decides to pass at that time. So we should be actively working to get as much money into after-tax tax-free positions or tax advantage positions as we can. Um, for those of you who aren't working, for those of you who are retired, you may be thinking, oh, darn, that ship has already sailed. No, it hasn't. Anyone who has IRA assets or any qualified assets can work on conversions. There is no requirement to be working. There is no income limit, high or low. There is no age limit, high or low. Anyone can do a conversion. And honestly, we should be looking at those conversions as much as possible. Now, I don't think it makes sense to do a conversion in January. We're, I'm actually uh, putting the cart before the horse a little bit here. We'll be talking about Roth conversions in our September monthly our, uh, market update. So stay tuned for that. That's something that you should focus on more at the end of the year rather than the beginning of the year, but have that on your radar. So my number one tip right now for how the markets are doing right now, the big thing that we wanna look at are Roth IRAs. Okay, with that in mind, let's kind of shift gears a, a little bit here. Let's start talking about the markets. Let's start talking about investments and kind of what we've been seeing so far. To do that, we're gonna look um, back to last year. Here is uh, GDP over the last three years. Um, nobody's really talking about this for some reason. I don't know why. We saw good, stable GDP growth. Uh, through 2017, through 2018, through 2019. That's what the Federal Reserve tries to pay attention to. They want things good and consistent. And then boom, all of a sudden, we saw two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. What does that mean? That magical R word, recession. We were in a recession in 2020. Two consecutive quarters means that we're in a recession. Now, we saw a wonderful bounce back. Quarter three of 2020 was fantastic. Quarter four was a little bit more on track with what we're looking for. And so far with quarter one, things are looking pretty good. Unemployment numbers came out yesterday a little bit better than expected. Um, 
The uh, housing prices are a little bit worse than expected. Earnings right now are kind of the, the big thing. We're seeing a lot of large corporations in their earnings. And so far, there hasn't been anything too detrimental. A lot of companies have missed their earnings by a little bit, but their revenue targets were, were higher than expected, which is good. Let's take a look at the markets. So here I've got our good buddy, uh, Yahoo Finance. You guys know we love this site. Yahoo Finance is a free resource. Anyone can use it, finance.yahoo.com. I'm looking at the S&P 500 specifically. So the S&P 500 makes up about uh, approximately 500 stocks. There are, there are um, like 480 or something like that right now. But the S&P 500, as it's been trading, this goes back one year, 12 months. We saw the peak happened in uh, early March. And then we saw the decline that came from COVID. We've seen the recovery since then. I'm sure many of you have heard we've hit all-time highs. We keep hitting all-time highs. What's interesting about that is if we look at the total here, top to bottom, we weren't actually back to even. I mean, there were points where we had crossed, but then there were losses again, points that we had crossed, we had lost again. It wasn't until about mid-November that the markets recovered what happened in about uh, three or four weeks. So very consistent with what we've seen with market volatility in the past, the volatility happens quickly. The recovery happens a little bit more gradually. Um, I'm saying a little bit more gradually, this is actually one of the fastest recoveries that we've seen, but by comparison, it was also one of the fastest loss periods that we had seen. So very, very volatile down and good volatility back up, but it wasn't until November. We, it took us about uh, seven months to recover what happened in one month. Now, looking forward, we don't really know what's gonna happen. If you uh, were logging into this uh, discussion here today saying, oh man, Gage has got the crystal ball fired up, let's find out what's going on. We don't know what's gonna happen. The big key with the markets, the one thing that we really do like to point out is they are always consistent. There will be volatility. I don't know if the markets are gonna be up for 2021. There's indication that suggests that we're kind of back on track. Uh, company earnings are looking pretty good. So that's kind of positive news that might suggest that the markets are up. Uh, there's also some crazy stuff going on. So unemployment is still sitting uh, way higher than it was in 2017, 2018. We're still looking at economic stimulus. The Federal Reserve is keeping rates low, which all suggests that maybe things are a little bit rockier than the markets are suggesting. So I guess our advice here is to be careful. The number one piece when investing across the board is to make sure that you're investing in proper investments, that you your own personal risk tolerance is being matched. Um, I wanna take just a second and talk, uh, talk about some different uh, investment um, uh, categories maybe that we have. Most of us are probably participating in our 401ks. Uh, it's a really good time right now. We've been suggesting this in our OWA live segments. We've been suggesting it in our college courses. I'm gonna suggest it here. Now is a very, very good time to look at your 401k, rebalance and potentially reallocate. Markets are trading high, which means it's a good time to maybe make some adjustments. Um, at least take a look at it. One thing that I really wanna strongly suggest is avoid target retirement funds. Anyone who's talked to me for more than five minutes on this knows that we are not big fans of those target retirement funds. These are, uh, these are identified by some number in the name, like the Vanguard Target 2025 or the Fidelity Freedom 2030. Please avoid those. This is not necessarily because the markets are at this certain point or whatever. This is just in general. Those, those funds don't really do all that well, and you could do better by just doing a little bit of research yourself. So avoid target, target date retirement funds. Uh, look at rebalancing. I think it's uh, an incredibly important thing to do, especially after we've seen such a tremendous run up in the stock markets. There's a very good chance that your allocation's a little bit out of balance. You might be holding too much in equities, which means you might need to peel back a little bit and allocate towards more conservative positions like bonds or something like that. Um, the other big thing that we're suggesting, a lot of companies are adopting Roth 401ks. If you are actively contributing to a 401k, see if your employer offers a Roth and then start participating in it. 
For those of you who are participating in IRAs or Roth IRAs, outside held investments, the same kind of tips are, are recommended. So we wanna look at the allocation. Look, oh, my pen just died. Look, uh-oh, whoa. Um, well, oh, there we go. Look, uh, of course the pen dies when you don't need it to. Oh, and there goes my, man, you know, you do these new things and everything just kind of falls apart. What a mess this whole thing is. Let's take a look at our notes. Here we go. Look at your allocation. Um, sit down with your financial advisor and re review kind of how things are looking right now. Make sure that you're not taking too much risk based off of what you're wanting to do. Um, I, I just think that that's a good practice to do at the beginning of the year. Sometime between January and the time you file your taxes should be where you go through and uh, assess those allocations, reassess goals, and talk about kind of what you want to do in 2021. Um, I also think it's a, a good decision to uh, max out contributions like we had talked about. Max contributions. Um, you can still make a 2020 contribution up until the time you file your taxes. So if you have any earned income, it would be good to sit down with your advisor, invest with your Roth, make a six or $7,000 contribution to that Roth, and then put it to work, invest it somewhere that you are comfortable with. And then what I like to say here is balance your green, yellow, and red money allocations. Make sure that you're having those discussions on a regular basis to adjust where those allocations are. Maybe moving some money from green into yellow if you're looking for a little bit more upside potential, maybe carving back a little bit of risk by moving red into yellow and green positions. That might be something to consider. Um, the other piece that we wanna talk about just real quick here are non-qualified accounts. These are after-tax taxable accounts. If we have any of those things, Right now, um, we should be looking at um, kind of what our game plan is for 2021. We should be looking at the internal holdings and seeing what we can do to minimize the tax exposure that we have there. Normally, at the end of the year, you have the ability to pair off gains and losses. That's actually something that you can do throughout the year. So take a look with your non-qualified accounts at uh, pairing off losses, pair off losses, and um, look a little bit uh, forward at uh, different investment strategies, different things that you can do to reduce your tax exposure, but still see some level of gains. Look at uh, taxes. Um, so that's kind of our game plan for what we should be doing in 2021. We would encourage everyone to continue working with financial advisors and, and uh, tax professionals to get good advice specifically for what you're trying to accomplish, but make sure that your risk tolerance is being matched with the investment that you're in and make sure that um, you're maximizing your taxes as much as possible. Now with the last uh, five or 10 or so minutes, um, I kind of wanted to talk about um, these crazy uh, market conditions that we're facing. So Looking back at history, anytime we've seen significant market volatility, we have these things in the industry that we call red herrings. There are, um, there are certain um, occurrences, I guess, that happen in the markets that trigger significant market events, significant market volatility. So let's rewind all the way back to like 1987. In 1987, we had the flash crash, uh, what they're calling Black Monday, what they called Black Monday. That had never happened before. We had never seen that kind of volatility at that time. This was deemed a red herring. That flash crash was deemed a red herring. And it sent the markets into a little bit of a tizzy through all of 1987. Um, fast forward a little bit to the year 2000. We had kind of three red herrings that came up. It, it started with uh, the dot-com bubble burst. We started to see a little bit of pullback in the markets. Um, because of all this faith that we had put in these dot-coms like uh, Amazon and things like that. That was coupled by Enron collapsing, which we had never had such a large company completely fold up shop and uh, have all kinds of fraud issues and people going to jail. 
And right as we thought we were coming out of it, the terror attacks happened in 2001, September of 2001. So we had three red herrings that sent the markets into a tailspin. Top to bottom loss was about 52, 53%. We recovered that in 2008, we had another red herring. Uh, that was the banks that were deemed too big to fail, these credit default swaps, all this crazy stuff that was happening on Wall Street, sent the markets into a tailspin. Uh, and then as late as 2020, I mean, we've seen significant market volatility with the coronavirus. That was a very uh, unique occurrence. We'd never had a global pandemic pretty much shut down the world like the coronavirus did. And that sent the markets into a tailspin. The point that I want to make with this is that the markets always have volatility. There's consistency in the volatility with the markets. People try to identify those red herrings and say, oh, this is what it is. But the truth is we don't know what a red herring is until after the market volatility already happens. Um, I was just on a phone call with, with another client who said, uh, yeah, I, I just don't know if I want to be getting into the market at this point. And I said, you know, if you're uncomfortable with market volatility, then we probably have a bigger problem anyway. You need to make sure that your risk tolerance is being matched with the investments that you're in. You should be, um, if, you, if you can't sleep at night because of how the markets are doing, you shouldn't be in the markets. Now I'm, I'm bringing this up because a lot of people are now talking about this whole GameStop thing that's happening right now as the next potential red herring of the markets. I don't know if it is or it isn't. Honestly, guys, I don't have a clue with that. This is unprecedented. We've never had something happen like this before. Is this what's going to send the markets into a tailspin? I do not know. I do not know even if the markets are going to go into a tailspin. But I thought it would be good if we chatted about that just real quickly to talk about what happened. I'm going to try and leave my opinion out of this as much as possible. But I, like I think most of you, am kind of sick as to what's going on with all this stuff. So real quick. Just a quick history lesson. We need to learn about shorting. Shorting is a strategy that a lot of uh, organizations will use to hedge a bet. It's to protect yourself from the downside exposure. Now, unfortunately, there are a lot of organizations that are out there right now, very large, what are called hedge funds. Oh, I see my chat is already flashing like crazy. So I'm probably ticking somebody off. A hedge fund is a large pool of assets. It's an investment manager that pools assets and has a very specific strategy as to how they invest. A lot of these hedge funds are doing what's called naked shorting. And sorry, this pen keeps skipping out on me here. Naked shorting. Sounds like a bad, oh, and there goes my computer again. Well, guys, you know, I've got this brand new Microsoft Surface and it's totally crashing on me. I don't know what's going on with this thing. Naked shorting, here we are. Sounds like something that might happen at a bad college party or something like that. Okay, it's not like that. Naked shorting just means that these guys are buying uh, short options to kind of drive the markets down. The big one that everyone's talking about is GameStop, GME. There are half a dozen others that these companies are shorting. Here's kind of what happens. We've got, let's say Tom, Dick and Harry here. Tom, Dick and Harry are talking about their investments. Right now, Tom is holding 10 shares of GameStop. You know, I probably shouldn't use GameStop. Oh my gosh. Okay, we're, we're learning here, guys. I don't know why this keeps crashing. Maybe it's because I'm not supposed to talk about GameStop here. The SEC is coming through and shutting down my computer or something like that. Okay, we'll stop saying GameStop. To, we'll say Apple. Tom has 10 shares of Apple. Dick thinks, you know what? Those 10 shares of Apple... I think Apple's probably gonna lose. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask Tom if I can borrow his shares for some period of time. I'm not actually gonna own Apple, but I'm just gonna borrow his shares. Tom says, yeah, sure, that's fine. As long as you pay me a little bit of interest, you can borrow my shares if you want. Apple, let's say right now is trading at $100 a share. When Dick buys that and sees that the stock market loses, let's say it goes from $100 down to $50, what Tom is going to do is he's going to take those shares and he's going to sell them to Harry, which he can do with a short option contract. So now, Ter now Harry owns, oh, well, this is just frustrating, guys. I don't know about you, but it's driving me nuts. Um, Harry owns 10 shares. Oh, my goodness. Lessons learned. He just bought those 10 shares. 
Uh, okay, we're gonna have to call it good. My computer keeps crashing. I don't know how to make it stop. If you want an explanation on this, give me a call and we can go through this together on our Zoom call. The point here is that these guys are purchasing these shares that they don't actually own. And so what's happening right now is we've had online forums like Reddit go through, they found that these, these hedge funds are shorting these. Right now, um, some of these stocks are trading like 140% short, which means that there aren't even enough shares in existence to cover the bets that these guys are making. So these groups on Reddit are saying, okay, what we're gonna do is call the short squeeze. We're gonna force the price up so that when these guys have to pay these contracts back, they're, they're not gonna lose money. They're not gonna make money on the loss of the stock, but rather they're gonna make money on the gain. We're gonna make money on the gain by holding out and continuing to do this. This is kind of nasty manipulation across the board and it's getting kind of, getting kind of nasty. Smaller brokerage houses like Robinhood and Weeble are starting to close down trading shares dangerous, dangerous stuff going on. Um, they can't do it, they're saying, because the SEC is shutting them down. It's probably something to do with regulatory, maybe something to do with liquidity. The point I'm trying to make here is this is kind of unprecedented. We don't know what the markets are gonna do. Please be very cautious. If, if market volatility scares you, then you should be reassessing. We need to jump back to the discussion that we're having before. We need to look at our allocation balances and we need to protect ourselves from the downside because we just don't know what's going to happen with the markets. Okay, guys, I'm, I'm actually going to call it good with this. We were going to go until 1130, but given how choppy my computer is cutting in and out, I think uh, I'm going to quit while I'm behind and call it good. I'm going to hang out here for just a, a few more minutes. Um, if there are any specific questions that anyone would like to ask uh, about um, kind of what the markets are doing, what we are looking at with uh, allocations and things like that, I'd be happy to address that. Um, otherwise, uh, you're free to go. Um, next uh, event that we're having is in February, last February in uh, April, we're going to be or last February, <laughs> uh, computers got me all frazzled here. Last Friday in February, we're going to be hosting another one of these events that we're going to be talking about. Um, estate planning and some of the strategies that you can utilize to make sure that your beneficiaries are covered. So stay tuned for that. We'll go into that a little bit more. Let me pull up the chat here, see if we have any specific questions that we want to address. Um, let's see here. All your computer belongs to us. Uh, what are some of the key indicators that we look at? So um, when comparing overall market performance, I think the S&P 500 is kind of the best benchmark to consider. Uh, we do have some fund managers that are looking at certain different algorithms. So like the 10 rolling day average of the S&P 500 all the way up to the 200 rolling day average of the S&P 500. Um, we also will look at the bond markets, which we didn't really touch into too much today. Uh, interest rates are relatively low. So bonds are pretty boring right now. There's not a whole lot going on with those. And it's hard to find a bond that pays a pretty decent price. You could look at like AGG if you're looking to uh, keep an eye on bond markets. And uh, market thinkers, um, there are a couple that, that we'll look at. Uh, I think anyone who is saying something about market advice, I always take it with a grain of salt just because I feel like a lot of times they're trying to sell you something and <laughs> hey, surprise, that includes us. I mean, we are financial advisors. This is how we make our living is by advising on different strategies, advising on different uh, investments. So. Um, take a look and see what's being recommended and to see if it makes the most sense for you. Um, I, I do think that there are some fantastic organizations like the Think or Swim program through TD Ameritrade, I think is a, a good one. I know we have a lot of clients that uh, go through the Motley Fool and um, look at the advice columns there. I, honestly, I think you can get all kinds of good financial information for free from Yahoo Finance just as well. So those are kind of the the market thinkers, if you will. Um, I don't have cable, so I don't watch CNBC or anything like that or Fox Business. Um, I'll let you guys decide whether those are good or bad. Um, we did have a question. Uh, we, we are recording this. Uh, whatever choppy little bits we can uh, salvage from this will be on our YouTube page. Um, Tom, to your question, I haven't heard of John. I'll, I'll look him up and see kind of what's going on. Um, let's call it good for today. So thanks everyone for bearing with us. Always fun with a new technology, with a new thing that we roll out. Uh, we appreciate your patience and we look forward to meeting with you. Of course, if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to email me. I guess I should, 
attempt to write my email address down here. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, not gonna work. Email address is gkemsley at oxfordwealth.com. Someone put that in the chat for us if you don't mind. gkemsley at oxfordwealth.com. Also feel free to give us a call. Um, you can call our uh, Albuquerque office of uh, area code 505-891-9800. For those of you who are joining us in Texas, our Texas number 512-964-1002. Um, take this opportunity, sit down, review with us. We'd be happy to uh, discuss to whatever level you'd like. Just make sure we haven't missed anything here. I'm gonna leave up the uh, email address and the uh, phone numbers here for just a second. I will be signing off. Thank you everybody for joining us today and we will see you next month for our next monthly market update. Thanks everybody.